Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. I'd also like to give a shout out to Horrifying History, which is an excellent podcast you can find on all major podcast platforms, and it's all about the history, lore, science, and the supernatural colliding. It's a really cool podcast, and it's Canadian, so I have kind of a soft spot for it. But I encourage you to check it out. Just search for Horrifying History. For thousands of years, the landscape of Canada was dominated by the indigenous who called the land home. Long before the Europeans arrived, the indigenous formed alliances, unique cultures, controlled territory, and shaped the landscape. Today, I'm looking at the Anishinaabe. Now, each month on my Saturday episodes, I like to make sure that half deal with indigenous history, because the indigenous have a fascinating history that influenced Canada immensely. And I've decided that each month, one of those episodes is going to look at the history of one of the indigenous groups. Now, covering a group like the Anishinaabe, well, it's like saying I'm going to cover the history of the Mongols or the British or the French or the Chinese or the Japanese. It's a huge culture with a huge history and so much to it. And I can't get to all of it. I'm not Dan Carlin. I can't do a hardcore history six hours, but I'm going to do the best that I can. Most of this episode will cover the history of the Anishinaabe before and after European arrival along with looking briefly at various important Anishinaabe over the years. I also apologize if I mispronounce anything. I'm also focusing, as can be expected, on the Anishinaabe of Canada, rather than the Anishinaabe in the United States. The first thing to cover is just who are the Anishinaabe. The Anishinaabe are a group of culturally and linguistically related Indigenous groups that are found in Canada and the United States. Most of their land is centered around the Great Lakes, but the indigenous groups can be found as far west as Saskatchewan. If you were to look at a map of the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, it would stretch from Montreal to Regina. The Anishinaabe's name is used most often to describe the Ojibwe people, and many other groups identify as Anishinaabe, including the Chippewa, Adawa, Algonquin, Nipissing, and Mississauga, along with the Oji Cree and the Métis. According to Elder Basil H. Johnston, The name Anishinaabe translates as beings made out of nothing and spontaneous beings. Oral traditions state that the name comes from the word Anishinae, which was the first word uttered by the Anishinaabe upon creation. At Manitoulin Island, Anishinaabe means second man and refers to the story of Nanabojo and the Great Flood. Nanabozo was an Ojibwe trickster and cultural hero who was one of the four sons of the Spirits of Directions. He had a human mother, and his father was E. Bangishimog, translated as In the West. He was sent to Earth to teach the Ojibwe, and one of the first tasks was to name the plants and animals, and he is said to be the inventor of fishing and hieroglyphs. I'm going to play a story about Nanabojo that was part of the Ontario School broadcast in 1971. It is narrated by storyteller Alanis Obasawan, and it's a few minutes long, but it's a great story, so I hope you enjoy it. This year, um, on the moon, there is people living there. And um, there is a woman, and she is very beautiful. And she's sort of an older woman. And she's very much loved by all the people on the moon. And they come to her, you see, to ask for advice to whatever they want to do. But there is two relatives, or two women, who are supposed to be friendly with her, but they are very, very jealous of her. So one day they want to get rid of her and they give her a good push. And what happened? She fell off the moon, you see, and she fell all the way down into a lake. And then she came to the bottom of the lake and it was the earth. And then she met with all these people, Indian people. And the Indian people, they see this woman, she's so beautiful, and they really have much respect for her. So they're very happy, you know, to see her. And um, they make a wigwam for her. You see, this is happening right here in Ontario. They make a wigwam for her, these um, Ojibwe people. 
and they come to her for advice and they feel that she's very important, you see, and they call her Nukumis, which means in Ojibwe, uh, grandmother. And after a long while, when she stayed on the earth, she became pregnant and she had one child, a girl, and she called her We Nona. And we Nona grew up, and when she became a teenager, she was uh, very beautiful. And the braves around want to marry her, and they would come to Nokomis and ask her hand, you know, to be married. And she would have no part of it. She wanted to keep her a little bit longer, you see. So uh, one day, she, we Nona is walking in the forest, just taking a little walk. And uh, the wind come by, you see, the west wind. And it, at a very, very fast speed. And he'd been watching Winona and he was wanting her. So he comes very fast, you know, and he makes boom like this and he grabs Winona and he takes her all the way out west. Wow. So, and he puts her in a little shack and he closes the door and he leaves her there because he has to go and make wind all over the place, you see. So... Nokomis is so unhappy, she don't know what happened to Winona, and she's crying and moaning, and it's terrible. So she's praying and doing all sorts of magic, hoping that uh, it's going to bring back her daughter, but nothing works. So there's an eagle flying in the sky, and he sees her. So he thinks, I'm going to go down and talk to her. So he comes to Nokomis, and he said, uh, Nokomis, he says, no, for you to cry. He says, I'll tell you what happened. He says, you know the west wind? Why, well, he come here, and when Winona was walking in the wood, he just grabbed her and took her out west, very far away, and he put her in a shack. And when he's there, he's not even nice to her. He beats her up. And when he goes away, he locks her up, and she can't come out. And he's away for two, three months, and she's starved, and she's having a very bad time. But he says, me, I'm only a small eagle. And the wind is so much stronger than me. But he says, I fly around and I watch what's happening. But I can't go and, and rescue her because the wind is going to kill me, you see. So Nokomis listens to this and she feels a bit better because at least she knows where Winona is. So she continues making all her prayers and magic. and Until one day she hears some noise in the wood, you see. And... Uh, Sure enough, she hears, no commis, no commis. And she looks around and it's her daughter, we know now. And she's so weak, she's falling off on the ground and she tries to walk and it's just terrible. She looks, you know, very sick. So no commis grabs her and takes her into the wigwam and she asks what's wrong. And, and uh, we know now tells that uh, she was so unhappy and she, her face was so long that when, when the wind come, he's tired of seeing her. And... There's one baby, she was so weak, we know now, when, when the babies were born. There's one baby that died right away. And we know now, died too. And there was one little baby left. So Nokomis is so sad and feels so bad, she takes this little baby, you see, and she goes and she puts it on the ground and she puts a wooden pot over it to hide it in case the west wind come again and take it away, you see. And she comes to the the place where her daughter is, and she's moaning away and crying away and the, for the baby and her daughter for, you know, one day, two days, seven days. Meanwhile, the little baby is under the pot, and he's starving, you see. And uh, he began to make noise. And all of a sudden, she wakes up, you know, of this, and she realized that she's let not done anything for the baby so she rushes over to this pot and she lifts it up and when she lifts it up it was a little white rabbit so she thought many to punish me because I did not pay attention you see to the baby so she grabs the little la rabbit and she's rocking it rocking it back and forth in her arms and she says Nanabujo Nanabujo it means my little white rabbit you see and this is how Nana Bujo was born. But you see, Nana Bujo, who was the teacher that Manitou sent down to the people, 
Already as a small baby had much power, he was sick and tired of waiting to be fed, so for to scare the old lady, he changed himself into a rabbit. And so that he would have something to eat, the grass under yes. the pot. And then, you see, after that, he uh, could any, anything he wants to teach to the people, he would do so. But there's also much fun made of him. So this is how, I just want to explain how he was born. And he became the teacher. He could turn himself into a giant, into a bird, into an animal, into anything. The oral histories of the Anishinaabe say that they originated on the north coast of Canada and migrated to the west towards Lake Superior. In their histories, this is called the Great Migration. The oral stories say that the homeland of the Anishinaabe was called Turtle Island, and that the Anishinaabe are the descendants of the Abenaki people, referring to them as fathers, who themselves are said to be descendants of the Ladenape, or the Delaware people, which the Anishinaabe call grandfathers. In the oral history of the Anishinaabe, radiant beings in human form appear to the Anishinaabe in the Land of the Dawn, also called the Eastern Land, to teach them about the Midiwiwin life. It is said that one of the Mijis was too powerful and would kill people in the Eastern Land whenever they were in its presence. This being returned to the ocean, leaving the six great Mijis to teach the people. Each of these Mijis established clans for the people. These clans were the Bullhead, Crane, Pintail Duck, Bear, Little Moose, and Martin. After the clans were founded, the beings returned to the ocean. The beings would return in a vision saying the Anishinaabe had to move west to keep their traditional ways alive because people not of the Anishinaabe blood would soon arrive. After getting assurance from their allied brothers, the Mi'kmaq, and fathers, Abenaki, of their safety crossing other tribal territory, they moved inland along the St. Lawrence River to the Ottawa River through Lake Nipissing on the Great Lakes. It is said that the migration path of the Anishinaabe would become smaller turtle islands, and this is also called the Seven Fires Prophecy. The first Turtle Island was at the present site of Montreal, where the Anishinaabe divided into two groups. One went and settled along the Ottawa River, where the other group moved to the second Turtle Island near Niagara Falls. Continuing on to the third stopping place near the present-day Detroit, the Anishinaabe had divided into six nations, the Algonquin, Nipissing, Mississauga, Ojibwa, Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. According to the Potawatomi elder, Shep Shawana, it was around 796 AD that the Council of Three Fires was formed. The Three Fires were the Ojibwa, called the Older Brother, the Ottawa, called the Middle Brother, and the Potawatomi, called the Younger Brother. Within this alliance, each group had a specific function. The Ojibwa were the keepers of the faith, the Ottawa were the keepers of the trade, and the Potawatomi were the keepers of the fire. In all, the seven fires were believed to be the island on the St. Lawrence that would become Montreal, Niagara Falls, the Detroit River, Manitoulin Island, Bawating, or Sault Ste. Marie, Duluth, and Madeline Island in Wisconsin. For the leaders in the Anishinaabe, a chief was a temporary thing, and there were few lifetime chiefs. Their duties often included taking care of the sick, old, and orphans before themselves. The chiefs were taught to be advisors to the people, and that the spiritual consensus was the highest form of politics. During the winter, groups would go into the woods to hunt moose, deer, and bear, while in the spring and summer larger camps would come together to fish, gather wild rice, berries, and get syrup from maple trees. Agriculture was also developed by some of the Anishinaabe groups, especially in the areas of future Quebec City and Montreal and in southern Ontario. The Anishinaabe lived in dome-shaped wigwams that were made by tying saplings together at the top and covering them with sheets of bark or rushes. Insulation of moss could be added between layers in the winter for extra warmth. For transportation, the Anishinaabe used birch bark canoes with seams sealed with spruce or pine gum. In the winter, toboggans and snowshoes were the primary form of movement. The culture of the Anishinaabe was vibrant and highly artistic. Art forms included baskets made from ash trees and birch bark, and would often feature designs made of porcupine quills. When the Anishinaabe came across Europeans, they would incorporate European beads, cloth, and other items into their artistic endeavors. Music was also an important part of the cultural identity of the Anishinaabe. Flutes were often made by young men and used in courtship, while drumming was a form of entertainment, but also used in healing ceremonies. Due to the musical cultural tradition, many important Anishinaabe musicians have found success in music, including Lennon Sumner and Lawrence Hole. 
The spiritual life of the Anishinaabe, as we have seen, was very important to them. As was common in many indigenous groups, they saw spirits in many things, and their word for spirit was Manitou, and the great spirit was known as Kichi Manitou. Some groups of Anishinaabe would gather once a year for a celebration of the Grand Medicine Society, and these social events were when the elders would tell stories from the past, and tell stories of the spirits that lived across the land. When the Europeans arrived in Canada, the Anishinaabe established themselves as early trading partners in the fur trade. The first Anishinaabe to encounter Europeans were the Three Fires. The Anishinaabe were also hired as guides through the lands of North America, and some fur traders would intermarry with the Anishinaabe women, whose descendants would create the Métis ethnic group. The French tended to get along better with the Anishinaabe, since they were mostly fur traders and trappers, rather than settlers. During the Seven Years' War, the Three Fires Council fought with the French against the English, and had a long-standing trade with the French. That doesn't mean things were always good, and if you'd like to know more about that, I encourage you to check out my episode about the Beaver Wars. Later, with the British taking over from the French, the Anishinaabe would begin to have a relationship with the English, similar to the French at first, through fur trading and trapping. The British were more in the settler category though, which would lead to the eventual taking of land from the indigenous. The Anishinaabe contact with the Europeans would also involve them in wars of Europeans. From the Beaver Wars of the 1600s, something I did cover on the podcast like I mentioned, to Pontiac's War, to the War of 1812, all the way up to the World Wars and Korea. As more Europeans began to arrive in North America, the Anishinaabe would begin to play a key role in treaty negotiations, including the 1764 Treaty of Niagara. The treaty was between the British Crown and 24 nations that include the Anishinaabe, along with the Western Lakes Confederacy and the Seven Nations of Canada. The treaty was signed on August 1, 1764, and it transferred a narrow four-mile strip of land by the western shore of the Niagara River, while also establishing the relationship that was to be honoured by the new settlers moving into what would become Canada. Following the War of 1812, the British believed they had enough of a military presence in Canada that they did not need to work with the Anishinaabe anymore, or treat them with respect or fairness. This would begin the taking of land through treaties. The Anishinaabe would be involved in the 1850 Robinson Treaties, the Numbered Treaties of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 9, and the 1923 Williams Treaties. The Williams Treaties were signed, you guessed it, in 1923, by the governments of Canada and Ontario, and by the seven First Nations located in central southern Ontario. It was the last land treaty in Canada, and it transferred 20,000 square kilometres of land to the Crown. The Indigenous who signed received a one-time cash payment. Like so many of the Indigenous in Canada, despite treaties, trading, early contact, the Anishinaabe suffered because of Europeans and later Canadian rule over their traditional lands. In 1895, the Indian Act would ban the Jingle Dance, which was a healing dance for the Anishinaabe. In addition, the establishment of the residential school program would cause immense suffering under the assimilation colonial policies of the Canadian government. Residential schools, something that deserves its own episode that I will be doing down the road, forbid the use of any Anishinaabe languages and removed the Anishinaabe culture from the lives of the children at the schools. On top of all of that, the Anishinaabe would suffer from epidemics of smallpox and other diseases brought by the Europeans in the 17th and 18th centuries. While the Anishinaabe in Canada would fare better than those in the United States, their culture was changed forever through racist federal policies, which ramifications are still being felt to this day. Now I'm going to close out this episode by looking at some very notable Anishinaabe. Now I can't cover all of them, and I won't be going into deep detail because many of them actually deserve to have a full episode, and some of these Anishinaabe have already had episodes done about them on the podcast. Leonard Sumner, a member of the Little Saskatchewan First Nation in Manitoba, is a singer-songwriter whose music blends folk, hip-hop, and country music together. In 2013, he released his debut album, Res Poetry. In 2018, he would release Standing in the Light, which would receive a Juno nomination for Indigenous Music Album of the Year. Lawrence Houle, also known as Teddy Boy, was a fiddler from Ebb and Flow, Manitoba, where he was born in 1938. He taught himself to play Red River Valley on one string at an early age, and would go on to record a number of albums and tour extensively through the country. 
He would appear in films as a fiddler and was known for performing jigs while he was playing. His musical style followed indigenous and Métis styles, and for several decades he was devoted to recovering his Anishinaabe heritage. He would pass away in 2020. Richard Wagamese was born on October 14, 1955, in Menaki, Ontario, and he would describe his first home as a tent hung from a spruce. His family would fish, trap, and hunt, and both his parents were forced to attend residential schools, which Wagamese described as, Each of the adults had suffered in an institution that tried to scrape the Indian out of their insides, and they came back to the bush raw, sore, and aching. In 1979, Wagamese would begin working as a newspaper author for New Breed, an indigenous publication, before becoming a writer for the Calgary Herald. In 1994, he would write his debut novel, Keeper and Me, which was a co-winner of the Georges Bounet Award for Novel. He would publish five more books, a book of poetry, two children's books, and five non-fiction books that included two memoirs. He also wrote for the television series North of Sixty, in 2012, he released Indian Horse, his best-known novel, which won the Bird Award for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit literature. In 2017, the same year he passed away, it was turned into a feature film. George Copway was born in Trenton, Ontario in 1818, and would go on to become a writer, lecturer, and advocate for Indigenous people. His Ojibwa name, and I'll do my best, was ka ga 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 bao which means, He Who Stands Forever. In 1847, he published a memoir about his life that became a hit and made him Canada's first literary celebrity in the United States. In 1851, he published The Traditional History and Characteristic Sketches of the Ojibwe Nation. He would pass away in 1869, and in 2018, he was made a national historic person. Mary Spencer was born on December 12, 1984, in Wareton, Ontario, and would become one of Canada's top boxers. During her career, she would have 126 fights with 118 wins, including 8 by knockout, and she only has 8 losses. She has won 3 gold medals at the World Amateur Championships in 2005, 2008, and 2010, along with a bronze in 2006, and she would earn the gold at the 2011 Pan American Games. James Bartleman was born on December 24, 1939 in Aurelia, Ontario, and grew up in the Muskoka town of Port Carling. In 1963, he would earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from the University of Western Ontario, and would spend 35 years working in the Canadian Foreign Service, including as Canada's ambassador to Cuba from 1981 to 1983, the ambassador to Israel from 1986 to 1990, and the ambassador to the European Union from 2000 to 2002. That same year, he was sworn in as the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, during his life, he had received 12 honorary degrees, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Order of Canada, the Order of St. John, the Order of Ontario, and the National Aboriginal Achievement Award. Phil Fontaine was born on September 20th, 1944. He was forced to attend residential school and would later attend the Power View Collegiate afterwards. In 1973, he was elected as chief of his community for two terms. In 1981, he would graduate from the University of Manitoba with a degree in political studies. And in 1991, he was elected Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. From 1997 to 2000, and from 2003 to 2009, he served as the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. In 2004, he was awarded the Order of Manitoba. And in 2012, he was awarded the Order of Canada. He has also been awarded 11 honorary degrees. Tommy Prince was born on October 15, 1915 in Scatterbury, Manitoba, and he would go on to become one of the most decorated Indigenous soldiers in Canadian history, and a war hero of the Second World War and Korea. I'm not going to go into too much detail on Prince, because I actually have an episode coming out about him in just two weeks. Francis Pegamagaubau is another Indigenous soldier who became a hero, but his time was in the First World War. He is credited with killing 378 Germans as a sniper and capturing a further 300. He would earn several medals for his service, including the incredibly rare Military Medal with two bars. After the war, he would become a chief and advocate for Indigenous rights. Again, I won't go into too much detail on Francis because I did an episode on him a few months back, and you can find that on the podcast feed or by going to my website, www.canadaehx.com. I hope you enjoyed that look at the Anishinaabe people, and if you did, please give a rating and review. 
You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history, as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. I'd also like to give a shout out to all the wonderful people who are my patrons, including Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., Renee Beliveau, and Iris Gray. Information comes from the Canadian Encyclopedia, NativeLanguages.org, Canada History Project, Wikipedia, EveryCulture.com, NativeLanguages.org, Aboriginal People and Their Heritage, and Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada. Thanks, we'll see you again next time.